Please pray with me. Gracious God, thank you for our children. Thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for the times we graduate. Thank you for the, your patience for the times that we don't. Uh, help us to see you in each other, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we are again. Once again, I'm not preaching from one of the assigned texts for the day. Some may argue that today I'm not really preaching, but talking to you. They might be correct. If you've heard many of my sermons over the years, you've probably heard me say, while describing a part of the Bible text of that day, that this is one of those parts of the Bible that we just let go right over us. We ignore it. That's what we do with both the parts we don't understand and the parts that challenge us a bit too much. It can't really be saying that, so gone. And there are many passages in the Bible that are challenging. And it is easier to find and ponder the passages that are supposed to challenge those that we disagree with. If doing that brings us pleasure, we need to get back to reading the Bible for God to speak to us about us. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. This is one of the collects, which is a cool word for opening prayer, by the way, that is in our prayer book. It comes up for us right before Advent every year. The Bible or scripture reading is my focus for today. I want to commend it to you. You may have heard the phrase, Bible church. It's usually used in the context of a conversation where it is being established that my church is better, more spiritual, more right than your church. It can also mean that I'm more connected to God than you because I attend a Bible church. In some folks' estimation, the Episcopal Church is not a Bible church. And some evangelical churches are. The church does have lots of code words that insiders understand better than guests and newcomers. And sometimes insiders argue about these things, and I apologize to guests and newcomers on behalf of the entire church, because this is unfortunate. But families do do their laundry. We think we don't do it out in public, but we do. And it can take time for a person to become comfortable as a member of a church or group, learning the things that some think are important. But there are some things that should not be received in any church or group. One way that Episcopalians fight against the charge that we are not a Bible church is to count how much of the Bible is read in church on Sundays. We like that one because we win the argument if we look at it in that manner. Most Bible churches don't really read that much Bible in their worship services. The preacher reads a few verses or passage and and then preaches for 40 minutes or so. Right now you're probably glad that I won't. Dan. That preacher might quote a few more verses in the context of his sermon. So we are the real Bible church, right? We read from the Old Testament. We read from the Psalms. We read from the New Testament. And we read a gospel lesson every single Sunday. Can't get better than that, that's a lot of Bible. But I don't think the term Bible church is a useful phrase. No person or group owns 
the Bible. It's so easy to use the Bible to further our own agenda. And when we do, we get to, to wrap our agenda in words from the Bible. So we must be right if we can wrap our agenda around the words of the Bible. And you've probably heard someone say that the Bible is very clear about this issue. The Bible is clear about some issues. The Bible is clear about the issues that the Bible is concerned with. Our concern is to hear, read, learn, and inwardly digest to be able to learn about God. That's what the Bible is concerned with. And have any of you wrapped your head completely around who God is? I don't think so. Our learning is imperfect. Our reading of the Bible is imperfect. And I think that's perfect. I really do. We get into trouble when we believe we interpret the Bible perfectly. Because then we use our differences to separate ourselves from those who are imperfect. Right now, there are approximately 64 different Baptist denominations. Which of those interprets the Bible correctly? Well, if you were to ask one of them, they would say they're the one. But we know that's not right. And I don't want to pick on Baptists here because other denominations are doing their part to catch up. Christians disagree about what the Bible says about so many different things. And we spend more time disagreeing about the Bible than we do reading the Bible. If you want to make a Christian feel guilty, ask them how much they read the Bible. If you're feeling guilty about how much you read the Bible, I've never met a Christian who didn't feel guilty about how much or how little they read the Bible. So we're just in a club. I want to commend the Bible to you. I want you to not be afraid of it. That's not what it's for. The Bible isn't concerned with you being afraid. The Bible wants you in. If you've been insulted before about how you interpret the Bible, I want you to let it go. If you disagree with what the Bible says, I know this is weird to say it, but that's okay. Keep reading. If it's hard to understand, that's okay. Keep reading. If someone has used the Bible against you, that's not okay. But keep reading. It will probably encourage you to forgive. And reading the Bible will be good for you. If you've given up reading the Bible and you feel far from God, I want you to remember a story. It's called the prodigal son. You probably know that story. And what does the father do when the son begins to think about coming home and even before? He's always watching. And when he sees a glimpse, he comes running. That's who God is. But I really want to talk with you about our digestion. Our prayer today encourages us to inwardly digest. Digestion is not a light switch. I read the Bible this morning and now I get it. I told my wife I loved her when we got married and if I change my mind, I'll let her know. It's not how it works. We're in trouble if we live like we believe that we know all that we need to know about God already. Not all of you enjoy our conversations after the sermon, but I like how it exposes the digestion process. When we read the Bible, we need to be more like cows instead of soldiers in a weapon store. 
How many stomachs do cows have? The easy answer is four, but you know people even argue about that. It's a human thing, isn't it? Well, cows don't have four stomachs. They only have one, and it's got four parts, and they're called ruminants, if I pronounce that right. But somebody would argue with me about how I pronounced it, because that's how we roll. I'm going to go with either answer to make my point. Cows chew their food, but it's not ready to digest yet. And there might be a cow over here that's on his first chew, and there might be a cow over there who's on his fourth chew. Think about that one. It takes time and several chewings, which is not a real word, but I like it anyway, so I'm using it. Don't be in a hurry. If you are going to the Bible with your own agenda, that's okay. It's not perfect, but it's okay. Just give yourself some time to digest. If you're going to the Bible to learn about God, that's good. Eat and then pause. It's hard to digest our spiritual food when we're running around. I'm starting to sound like a parent, aren't I? Sit down, digest your food. I heard that one. Savor your food. Eat slowly. Pay attention to your spiritual hunger pangs. And meals are almost always better with company. If you can't eat, read the Bible with the people of your church. Find some time to digest together. The Bible study is one way of doing that. A cup of coffee or tea and a conversation about a sermon or passage of the Bible is a good way to digest. And a good goal is to have the digestion conversation with someone who loves you more than they love being right or telling you that you are wrong. Get together, read the Bible, and, and have pleasure like the Thursday morning group does watching The Chosen. They have fun. They learn, and it's fun. It's how it should be. The more you read the Bible, the better you will get at it. Kind of like the more you're in a relationship, the more you know the people and the persons. You'll learn more and more. And as you do, as you learn more and more, be gentle with those who are younger in their reading, who are only on their first two while you're on your fourth. Give them time to chew their food. Don't give them answers before they have time to digest. Enjoy the meal. Let others enjoy theirs. Ask them what they enjoyed. We learn more about God when we enjoy the meal. When we connect with others, each other, over our spiritual meals, it helps our connection with God. It's kind of like church. We gather for a holy meal. We read from the Bible and, and digest a bit in the liturgy and, and open our hearts to respond to God. Then we go home and hopefully we digest some more. And even before we start thinking about our next meal, God has it prepared for us. That's who God is. Amen. When he smiles like that, I know something's coming. <laughs> <sighs> we, we already had a comment, and it's, and it's fantastic because I learned something. From the name of a cow's, like one of the parts of the cow's stomach or one of their stomachs, depending on where you land on that argument, uh, we have, it, it's the word rumen, from where we get the word ruminate. Ruminate. Come on. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I'm still struck that it takes time. We want things instantly. Yeah. Because we want to use it and not incorporate it. 
So the, w- one of the questions I had when, when you were talking about like not rushing, not hurrying, and I'm just going to bluntly ask you the question, what do you think this is, where do you think it comes from? Where does the hurry, when it comes to, we have to land on an answer about the Bible, where does that come from? Where does that hurry to arrive at the spot come from, do you think? I think multiple things. I was okay. reading this internet thing about how Americans are perceived overseas. And they said, Americans eat in their cars while they're driving. I went, uh-oh. <laughs> and, and they drink coffee while they're moving. They don't sit down and drink their coffee. I went, uh-oh. Because we all, we all want a to-go cup, don't we? And I think part of it is fear. I think we are really afraid of intimacy. We want it more than anything else, but we're afraid of it. We're afraid of intimacy with God, and we're afraid of intimacy with others. So we pop in for our Sunday morning, have our dose, and then go away, and, and we're safe again. And um, there's nothing in Scripture that encourages that. So I think, I think we're afraid. And, and, and the longer we sit with God and are quiet with God, I promise you, you see God and you see yourself. And sometimes we're ready for that, and sometimes we're ready for that not. So that's where I go with that question. So. I think sometimes, too, we're uncomfortable with relationships mm-hmm. because we can't control them. You know, if, if I need to have a conversation with you and I might lose, I might, you know, you may not agree to my point, which I think is right. It, I think you really need to have an actual conversation and an actual relationship in order to work through that. And mm-hmm. it's something that I think people aren't comfortable with. I hate to tell you this, but sometimes God doesn't agree with our interpretation of scripture. Uh, someone texted in saying that the, in the Sunday school class, the conversation on scripture study group, uh, they talked about how God pursues us relentlessly, but then also transforms us over time. Like it's not a, uh, oh, there, you're done. Everything's fine now um, and stuff. So uh, someone also texted in and said, Father Ralph, that sermon was utterly amazing. <laughs> Uh, Thank you. We'll be here all weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the, the other thing that I, had, that I thought I had about time was just in talking about our own digestive process. I, I had to look this up. I thought it was way shorter. I thought that we probably digested our food in like that probably 15 to 20 hours frame. It, it's actually a full 36 hours can be up to full 30 before it goes all the way through my system and my body's done with it. So, like, the digestion thing, can you, I mean, like, what would it look like to, like, read something from the scriptures and then not talk about it with anyone else and um, just ruminate on it for 36 hours before I ever start to apply? I mean, that would transform the way that I look at mm-hmm. the scriptures. Mm-hmm. And yet, at the same time, some of us ruminate better in conversation with others, as opposed to just alone. So some of us, me, I I need both. I need both because sometimes my rumination gets stuck. Back back to Ajita for us Italians, you know? Heartburn, right? Yeah. It's not not going where it needs to go. And, And I need you, either on purpose or sometimes by accident. You'll come along and say something and I'll go, Bing, now I get it. Just because I was near you saying something about something else that connected with this thing that was going through me. We need each other. And for all the ways that I've given you heartburn over the years, I do apologize. Because <laughs> I have. But do you really? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so, what yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.